Welcome to this video on capacitors and some of the theory related to capacitors. In this video we're going to look briefly at the construction of capacitors and we're also going to look at some key formulas relating to capacitors. A capacitor is a component that stores charge in a circuit and to begin with I want to look at some key terms that we're going to introduce on the right hand side here. So the first of which is the letter C which gives us this term capacitance. And capacitance is a measure of how much charge a capacitor can store. Capacitance is measured in farads, or F for short. The second term Q is for charge, and charge is measured in coulombs, which we give the letter C. The last term that we're going to look at is E for energy, and energy is measured in joules, or letter J. So let's first of all look at the symbol for the capacitor. If you have a look at this simple circuit that I've got on the left hand side, we've added a capacitor into this circuit. And the symbol for the capacitor is two parallel lines here. And the reason for this is quite important because the construction of a capacitor is something like this, where we've actually got two metal plates, two parallel metal plates that are separated by a small gap in the middle. And Capacitors come in many different shapes and sizes, but this kind of construction is consistent among a lot of capacitors. The capacitor is quite unusual because we have this gap here between the two plates, and that means there's actually a, a gap or a break in our circuit. And so normally we'd expect, because there's a break in our circuit, this gap here, current can't flow and the circuit can't function. In truth though, current can flow in a circuit that contains a capacitor so long as the capacitor is charging. And once the capacitor is fully charged, current can't flow anymore. The only reason this is possible is because of the very, very small gap between the two plates. And the gap I'm going to mark on as the letter D here for the distance between the two plates has to be so small as to allow the capacitor to function. The other thing I'm going to mark on this diagram here is the area of the plates. I'm marking that on as A. Now that we've identified some of these key parameters, let's give them some values and have a look at some of the key formulas that relate to capacitors. So let's say first of all that my capacitor here has a capacitance C of 10 microfarads. Let's say that the area of its plates is 0.2 meters squared. Let's say that the distance between the plates is 3 micrometers. And finally, let's say that I connect this capacitor to a power supply and the power supply has a voltage of 8 volts. Let's look at the first of our formulas that we're going to look at in this video which is to work out charge. And we're gonna say that charge Q equals CV, or C times V. So what we're saying in this formula is to work out the charge, we need to multiply the capacitance by the voltage. So, looking at our example here, we've said the capacitance is 10 microfarads. And so in our formula, we'll have to say 10 times 10 to the minus six, because it's microfarads multiplied by the voltage, which in this case is 8. When I calculate that, I get an answer of 8 times 10 to the minus 5, and it's a charge, so it's measured in coulombs. 8 times 10 to the minus 5 is a slightly awkward number. We could better express that as 80 times 10 to the minus 6 coulombs. The reason I've done that is because 10 to the minus 6 is one of our standard prefixes. 10 to the minus 6 we've seen in the capacitance above represents micro. And so finally, we can express this charge as 80 microcoulombs. Next, let's work out the energy stored in this capacitor. And to do that, we're going to use the formula E equals a half CV squared. And so our formula here is a half times the capacitance times the voltage squared. 
So again, let's use our example um, and put some values into this formula. So here we'll say a half times the capacitance, which we know is 10 times 10 to the minus 6. Multiplied by the voltage squared. So that's going to be 8 squared. And when I calculate that, I get 3.2 times 10 to the minus 4 joules. Again, 10 to the minus 4 is a slightly awkward number. 10 to the minus 3 is our standard prefix for milli. And so I can better express this as 0 0.32 times 10 to the minus 3. Which is the same as saying 0 0.32 millijoules. Next, let's calculate something called the flux density or the charge density of this capacitor. We've worked out that this capacitor stores 80 microcoulombs of charge, but that 80 microcoulombs could be stored across a very, very large area, very large capacitor, or it could be all squeezed into a very, very small surface area. So the next thing we're going to calculate is something called the charge density or the flux density. And we're going to use the formula D for density equals Q over A, the charge divided by the area. So looking at our example again, we know that our charge that we calculated on the previous slide was 80 microcoulombs or 80 times 10 to the minus 6. The area we've identified in our original parameters here as 0 0.2 meters squared. Meters squared is the proper unit for area, so we're going to say 0 0.2. Calculating that, I get an answer of 4 times 10 to the minus 4. And because we're calculating a charge, which is measured in coulombs, divided by an area in meters squared, the unit of this charge density is coulombs per meter squared. Again, this number, 10 to the minus 4, is quite an awkward number. It's not one of our standard prefixes. And so this value is probably better written as 0 0.4 times 10 to the minus 3 coulombs per meter squared. And we know that 10 to the minus 3 is the same as saying milli as one of our standard prefixes. So now we can say 0 0.4 millicoulombs per meter squared. Our last formula is probably the most complicated. And for that, we need to return to our diagram on the left-hand side here. And have another look at this gap between the two plates here. When a capacitor charges, it builds up a positive charge on one of the two plates and a negative charge on the other. And because of this, an electric field is formed. Now this works just fine if we have nothing in the gap here, just empty space, but we can improve our capacitor and allow it to store more charge by putting another layer in between our two plates here. And we call this a dielectric layer. The dielectric layer is not a conductor, but it does allow more charge to be stored. In order to apply this, we need to understand this new term, permittivity. And permittivity, we give the Greek letter epsilon. Below, I have two types of permittivity. I have something called the absolute permittivity and another called the relative permittivity. Absolute permittivity, we give the symbol epsilon naught, epsilon with a little zero next to it. And relative permittivity, we give the symbol epsilon r. A material's permittivity tells us something about how much charge can be stored if it's used as a dielectric in our capacitor. The higher the permittivity of our dielectric layer, the higher the capacitance of our capacitor is going to be. Let's imagine, first of all, that we have nothing in our gap here between the two plates, essentially a vacuum. 
This gives us our first term here, the absolute permittivity, epsilon naught, which is essentially the permittivity of free space or a vacuum. Its value is a constant, and it's 8.85 times 10 to the minus 12. The permittivity of a vacuum is the lowest possible permittivity that we can possibly get. Using a material as our dielectric layer, we're going to increase that permittivity to a higher level and therefore increase our capacitance as well. And this gives us the relative permittivity. And the relative permittivity depends on the material that we use. Different dielectric materials will have different relative permittivities and will therefore change the capacitance depending on the material that we've chosen. This leads us on to our slightly more advanced formula for capacitance. And it looks something like this. C, capacitance, equals A over D multiplied by epsilon naught epsilon R. So what we're seeing in this formula here is the capacitance is equal to the area divided by the distance between the two plates multiplied by epsilon naught the absolute permittivity, multiplied by epsilon r, the relative permittivity. In our example, though, we know the capacitance. We know the area and the distance. We even know this constant value for the absolute permittivity. The unknown in this case is epsilon r, the relative permittivity. We want to find out what's the relative permittivity of the dielectric layer that we've chosen to use in our capacitor. So the first thing we need to do is rearrange this formula. So, by dividing both sides by epsilon naught, multiplying both sides by the distance d, and dividing both sides by the area a, we have our new formula here. Let's rewrite that again. So we have the relative permittivity, epsilon r, is equal to the distance between the two plates multiplied by the capacitance, over the area of the plates multiplied by the absolute permittivity, epsilon naught. And let's put some values in there. So first of all, we know that the distance between the two plates is three micrometers, or three times 10 to the minus six. We know that the capacitance is 10 microfarads, so we're gonna multiply that by 10 times 10 to the minus six. And that's divided by the area which we've said is 0 0.2, multiplied by epsilon naught. And epsilon naught was a constant. We gave it a value of 8.85 times 10 to the minus 12. And when I calculate that value, I get an answer of 16.95. The relative permittivity doesn't have a unit as such, but what it does tell us is that our capacitor is able to store nearly 17 times more charge than it would have been able to do had we just had a gap of a vacuum between these two plates. So I hope you found this video useful. First of all, on the basic construction of capacitors, and then some of the key formulas relating to capacitors as well.